It's hard to imagine that some small business called Swallow Sidecar Company, which was established back in 1922 in the small town of Blackpool, England, producing sidecars for motorcycles, would eventually become one of the most prestigious automotive brands. And a significant part of this achievement is attributed to the introduction of what was initially considered as the sole sedan of the company, the Jaguar XJ, in 1968. The XJ abbreviation stood for Experimental Jaguar, and the car itself was intended to replace all other sedans of the mark, such as the 420, Mark X, Mark II, as well as the S-Type. The first gen XJ was truly an innovative car for its time, and while the brand's history could be the topic of a whole nother episode, today we'll talk about the last true Jaguar XJ. Let's begin. By the early 90s, just before the global recession, Jaguar was already facing some serious financial problems, making it rather challenging for the company to develop new cars. And their factory, located at Browns Lane, Coventry, was becoming technologically obsolete. It was then that Detroit came to their rescue, and in 1989, Ford acquired Jaguar for $2.5 billion, aiming to enter the luxury market through the British Big Cat. Right after the purchase, Ford entrusted the management of Jaguar to Bill Hayden, the head of production for Ford's European division. Hayden had already earned the reputation of a very demanding supervisor and leader. His strict and no-nonsense approach to work was shocking for Jaguar employees. He considered the state of the factory so terrible that he proclaimed, the only plant I've seen worse than Brown's Lane is the Gorky Automotive plant in Russia. And this comment made the local workers confront the reality of their situation. But by 1992, the position of the chairman of Jaguar was given to Nick Scheel, who had served as Ford's chief operating officer for five years. At that time, Jaguar was producing the XJ40. While its initial launch was planned for the early 80s, due to financial problems at Jaguar's previous parent company, British Leyland, from which Jaguar was liberated by 1984, the XJ40 was only released in 1986, and by that time, it was already lagging behind its competitors. For example, the 12-cylinder engine became available in the XJ40 only towards the end of its production, in February 1993, while its refreshed German competitors had V12 engines right from the outset. And the global recession that was setting in at the time clearly worsened the company's condition and Jaguar sales volumes were rapidly losing their altitude. By 1991, the company wanted 1,400 workers to go on voluntary layoffs. By 92, production had dropped to just 20,000 units per year. And by 94, Jaguar was losing more than a million pounds per day. Ford's dreams of British luxury were crumbling right before their eyes, and something had to be done, urgently. By the time Ford acquired Jaguar, the latter company was working on three separate projects. The XJ90 sedan, the successor of the current XJ40. The XJ41 sports car, the later cancelled XJS successor. And the last, most interesting one of them all, a V8 engine. Since, historically, Jaguar had only used inline 6 and V12 engines in all of their cars. Jaguar was already planning the successor to the XJ40 which was supposed to be an entirely new car. But Ford suspended its development, and instead proposed fitting the front and rear sections of the new car, along with the engine, onto the central section of the XJ40. However, by that time, the VA engine was not completed yet. Therefore, the new XJ, being the first Jaguar assembled under Ford's management, was presented at the Paris Motor Show in 1994 with the codename X300, Technically, it remained very similar to the XJ40, but the design of the car moved away from the square shapes of the previous generation, both on the outside and on the inside. By the way, the X300 was the first Jaguar, the design of which was drawn using a computer to achieve the most optimal aerodynamics. As for the engines, the X300 XJ, following Jaguar's traditions, was offered with a 3.2 and a 4 liter inline 6 as well as a 6-liter V12. And Ford, investing about $300 million into the development of the XJ, aimed to improve the quality of assembly while simplifying its process. The X300 was offered in various trim levels, and as befits a premium flagship, 
even with two wheelbases, including the long. But one of the most interesting trims was the Daimler. And I'm not referring to Daimler Benz, but to the separate British automotive company called Daimler, founded way back in 1896. However, the company was sold to Jaguar in the 1960s, and ever since then, the Daimler badge appeared on the highest trims of Jaguar cars until 2009. And in our case, the X300 Daimler was adorned with chrome and equipped with all possible additional options. From door and trunk closers, a full electric package, cruise control, seat and window heating, and even the new computer active technology suspension system, better known as CATS. Interestingly, in America, instead of Daimler, the top of the line XJ models were named after the British coach building company, known as Vanden Plus. However, if you desired a high trim XJ but couldn't afford the Daimler, there was another option called the Sovereign. It was also equipped with various luxurious features like electric adjusted leather seats with memory, cruise control and, in some cases, even the CAT system. And the Sovereign's interior, just like the Daimler's, was decorated with chrome. It's also worth talking about the high performance version of the XJ called the XJR. The pre-facelift XGR was equipped with a supercharged 4-liter inline-six engine, producing 321 horsepower and 378 pound-feet of torque. By the way, it was the XGR that became the first mass-produced road car from Jaguar to feature a supercharger, and the second road-legal Jaguar to use forced induction after the XJ220. The dynamic performance of the sporty version spoke for itself. The XJR accelerated to 60 miles per hour in 6.6 .6 seconds with the automatic 4-speed transmission and 5.9 seconds with the manual 5-speed transmission. The XJR differed from the regular XJs not only under the hood, as they can be identified by the color-matched grille, special 17-inch wheels with Pirelli P0 tires and a lower right height. The XJR was also equipped with the aforementioned CATS system. However, as with the Daimler and Sovereign, there was also a lesser alternative of the XJR, called XJ Sport. It was offered with wide 18-inch wheels and a stiffer suspension. They featured both 3.2 and 4-liter naturally aspirated straight-six engines, just like the base XJs, which also shared their matte black window trim pieces, although the Sport models can be differentiated by their Sport badging on the B-pillars and the trunk. So, the X300 was produced until 1997. After that, a facelift was introduced, named the X308. Now, instead of the badges like XJ6 and XJ12, only the XJ8 badge can be seen on the rear of the car. The facelifted models were only offered with 8-cylinder AJ V8 engines. From now on, paired exclusively with automatic transmissions. And there were three variants of this engine. The first one is a 3.2-liter engine producing 237 horsepower and 233 pound-feet of torque. Next is a 4-liter, producing 290 horsepower and 285 pound-feet of torque. And finally, the most powerful and probably the most impressive option, a supercharged version of the same 4-liter V8, producing 365 horsepower and 387 pound-feet of torque, available only in the updated Daimler and XJR. The latter differed from the previous generation not only in the engine bay, but also with new alloy wheels and a more refined design. The performance of the Wildcat was also improved. It accelerated from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 5.7 seconds, paired with a 5-speed automatic transmission from Mercedes. And its top speed was electronically limited to 155 miles per hour. On later models, when ordering a new XJR, you could also choose an additional sport package called R1 which included 18-inch BBS wheels, larger perforated brakes from Brembo, and a retuned suspension. But it didn't stop there, as in 2001, in order to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Sir William Lyon's birth, Jaguar made 500 examples of a special edition XJR, called XJR100, which was only available painted in the anthracite color and dark grey leather upholstery, finished with contrasting red stitching, and bird's eye maple. The XJR100 was also fitted with ventilated Bramble brakes and alternative 19-inch rims manufactured also by BBS. As for the Daimler or Vanden Plus, 
The models which were equipped with the optional supercharged V8 were now called the Daimler Super V8, replacing the previous generation's Daimler 6, or simply the 12-cylinder versions. In America though, this option appeared only by 2001 and was called the Vanden Plus Supercharged. Motor Trend described the X308 as a masterful blend of British luxury and American muscle, also dubbing it a muscle car in a tuxedo, and in 2018, Motoria stated that the X308 provides the most luxurious ride of any car ever made, thanks to its status as the last steel-bodied XJ as well as the first XJ equipped with a modern V8 engine, creating the perfect blend of classic and modern Jaguar. They also stated that this car looks appropriate and fits in just about anywhere, whether it's a parking lot of a mall or the driveway of a casino. Nine years after the start of the series, the last Jaguar XJ X308 rolled off the assembly line in December 2002, with a total production of 218,000 units. In the same year, it was replaced by the XJ X350, built on an entirely new aluminum platform. The Jaguar XJ, a car with an undisputable long history spanning 51 years in total, and its assembly was finished back in 2019. If its production had continued to this day, it would have truly deserved the title of an automotive veteran amongst cars like the Ford Mustang and Toyota Land Cruiser. The Jaguar XJ has become a true icon of the British automotive industry, and the car's design became so iconic and memorable from the very beginning, the Jaguar itself did not even dare to apply any major changes to it until 2009. Despite many calling the era of Jaguar under Ford's leadership the Dark Ages of Jaguar, it cannot be denied that due to the changes implemented by Ford, Jaguar managed to grow from some quirky car brand obsessed with its heritage into a significant and respected company. This collaboration helped the manufacturer both update its existing cars and greenlight entirely new models. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you don't miss the newest episodes. And I'll see you in the next one.